Okay, hello everyone. Um, so as, I, as the title can say, um, I'm gonna be talking about open science. It's a very, I would say, in general introduction um, uh, about what it is and why I do it. And, in, and then there's a bit of a, I wanna take some time to talk about sort of specific aspects about data and code sharing. So first of all, actually, what is something I, I'm starting to do in my talks, just making sure that, you know, you can hear me. Apparently we've checked that before that you can see my slides. A uh, couple of other things I wanna do is I wanna turn on um, the caption for the talk because I realize that some, it is helpful for some people if you are not an English native speaker. And the other thing, turn the pointer. Uh, you should have my slides on the chat. Um, I put them on OSF. And let's start a timer so that I know when I'm going over time. Let's do this. Okie doke. <coughs> right, so um, as I said, on the menu for this talk, we have uh, for like a first short part where I'm gonna talk, give you some definitions, very broad uh, because we're dealing with very soft concepts here. There's no like clear cut and dry definitions. And also maybe some of the motivations of why you would want to sort of engage in open science or in some of the practices that uh, might fall under the sort of the general umbrella of open science. And then I'm gonna talk a bit more specifically about some aspects about data um, and code management and sharing, because I have personally found those have been the most like um, helpful in my everyday life. And I tend to uh, sort of be, be a bit more knowledgeable regarding those. Okay. So open science, what is it? Um, so there is, is, as I said, it's hard to define, but uh, the way I, I've grown to sort of see it is sort of the metaphor I'm gonna go with here is that, uh, well, sorry, forgot. Uh, yeah, as I said, there are many ways to define it. And sometimes you end up having a long conversation about open science and you realize that uh, people keep using that word and you say like, I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, and you just realize that you both have very different definitions. So um, if you talk about open science with anyone, my recommendation is uh, first agree on what you mean by it so that you're not gonna talk past each other. Um, so yeah, the way I like to see it is like a big communal tent with many entrances and meaning that people come to do open science or come to open science for different reasons or through different pathways, right? Um, people, some people may come there uh, through the uh, open access. So meaning that you have this idea that the, the outcome of um, science that is published in journals would be accessible to everyone for free. Uh, and usually librarians have a lot to say about that. Um, and with the emergence of preprint that have gone beyond the original, like uh, where they were just at the beginning in, 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 in physics, uh, this is also an aspect that you're going to hear a lot about. Um, then in open science, you have a lot of questions about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, and obviously, as uh, a white, mostly heterosexual male, I'm not exactly in the best position to talk about that. But I could definitely um, sort of have some we could talk about that after that in the in the Q&A if you want. Um, there is the aspect of open data and uh, open source, which I'm gonna, which open source usually mean open code in this case, uh, which I'm gonna talk uh, later on during the talk. Uh, there is this idea of citizen science, the idea that uh, the stakeholders, uh, for example, the stakeholders of uh, the research uh, can get, can be, um, uh, can take part in the research process itself. So whether they are the patients or whether they're, uh, for example, citizens that are involved into uh, trying to solve a problem, they interact directly with researchers, for example. Um, there are the aspect of open education and making sure that the materials we create uh, to teach uh, are openly accessible to everyone. Uh, for example, MOOCs are a very popular thing uh, and they're definitely fall under that category. And more recently, uh, I think in the past 10 years, especially in psychology, there's been a lot of talk about the uh, reproducibility, reproducibility aspect of research. And so there is this sort of category to like open reproducible research. And uh, yeah, and that's pretty much where I sort of got into sort of 
open science. This was this was the door I came like I came to, um, and oops and well I'm not going through the list. There are other points because otherwise it could be like a whole talk just about that. So yeah, um, and just quickly once again. Um, we, I'm going to talk a little bit about reproducibility and replicability. And here again, I must give you a couple of definitions because you realize that people do not agree on those terms. So the way I tend to understand them or the way I'm going to, I will tend to use them in this context, in the context of this talk, is uh, follow sort of this, um, uh, this table here. So for example, when you have a given, uh, you have a set of results on a first uh, study, and um, then you try to, um, you rerun the study uh, and you either, uh, and you sort of, uh, so, so either you keep the same, you have exactly the same data and the same code and you see whether you get exactly the same results. So this, in this case, you will say that the results are reproducible um, or you can acquire a new batch of data, run a new set of participants for your experiments, what have you, whatever uh, type of research you do. So you get a new set of data, but you use exactly the same analysis. Uh, if you get the same results in the first and the second, then you talk, you say that the results are replicable. Um, if you use the same original data that you had, but you use a different method, but you still get the same results, you can say the results are robust. And then if you change both uh, the method, the analysis, and the data, and you still have the same results, then you can say that the results is um, generalizable. Okay, so mostly just going to be talking about those two here. Um, so yes, replicable. So when the data changes, um, analysis is when, uh, uh, robust is when the um, analysis change, but you keep the same data. And generalizable is when both change, but you still get the same results. Okay. <clears throat> And another aspect that you're going to hear a lot about um, in with respect to open science and reproducibility is the idea of like transparency, right? Um, and um, I like this quote by uh, John Clairbaut and David Donahoe because um, it sort of also relates to some of the issue around publishing uh, in science. And um, this was actually a long time ago, they said that like in the 90s, and they said an article about computational results is advertising, it is not scholarship. And the actual scholarship is the full software environment and code and data that produce the results, right? So the idea is that, um, the idea about transparency here is that we should actually be able to provide uh, the code and the data and ideally the software environment that we use to get to our results. <clears throat> uh, so in other words, you know, if someone in science says, yes, I know Kung Fu and my results are significant, most of us nowadays would go, well, show me. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, having just a result, the end result and the, and the p-value next to it. More and more, we actually want to see, um, you know, how the sausage was made and how you got there. Um, one thing that is good to keep in mind also so that you don't drive yourself crazy uh, trying to make everything uh, reproducible from the start is that things, um, when you talk about reproducibility and all those concepts I've talked about, go along a continuum, right? So. Um, for a lot of papers, uh, there's only the publication and we can have access to the data or to the code. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have, uh, you have papers where, you know, you got access to everything and with just a couple of clicks or a couple of uh, instructions on a, in a terminal, in a computer, you can just rerun everything, right? And then you have everything in between. Uh, and that's something I'm going to try to reiterate. If you're interested in doing things like this, don't necessarily try to aim this. Say, if you're starting from there, just start to just get a little bit there and then a little bit there. Don't try to go all the way there at once. Otherwise, you're going to, that's not a healthy way to approach this. So another thing that's good to keep in mind that I've learned sort of, not, I wouldn't say the hard way, but uh, sort of there uh, with a lot of the discussions that you have um, in the field, is the idea that something can be reproducible or replicable, and it can be transparent, but it doesn't make it true. Uh, so uh, you can be the so the trivial example I'm going to take here is you know you have this function, uh, some like it's co it's like this is a very like simple code, uh, and the idea is that um, you give it data, and it's going to give you uh, a result, 
And the function there is going to give you the answer to what's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Uh, but when you look inside the function, you see that it always is going to give you uh, the result 42. So um, your results here, uh, if you give it new data, uh, so it's always going to give you 42. So you would say, hey, this is replicable. Uh, if you give it the same data, it's also going to give you 42. And everything here uh, is transparent, right? You can see everything that has been going on. Uh, but that doesn't make it true nonetheless, right? So it's a bit of a trivial example, but this is also to show um, um, that, um, ah, sorry, um, I'll, I'll get back to that later. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to try to wrap up a little bit on, on this first part. But the idea is that open science um, is definitely not like uh, it is a community, but it is definitely not a single monolithic and like homogeneous community, right? It is made of a whole bunch of people who have you know different interests and come for different things. Um, and uh, and I can tell you one thing is definitely not one big happy family where unicorns ride, ride um, on rainbows towards the sunset. Like if any of you has spent some time look, having a look at what's going on in the open science Twitter or psychology Twitter in general, you can definitely see that um, it's, it's uh, yes, um, let's say that blood pressure can rise on all sides very quickly, very often. Um, but I think definitely one thing we, a lot of people can agree on is that definitely open science at least sort of covers a set of practices um, that can be used as mean to a certain end. Uh, and that's the point I was trying to make just before is that um, different depending on who you are, what your interests are, what study you run, um, you might have different, you know, um, like the end goal we might for all of us might still be that we want to produce high quality science but there are different ways you can get there uh, and there are different sort of intermediate steps so uh, for a very long time or and still nowadays um, you know we're still interested in very interested in producing new results right so discovering new things uh, now there's been a lot more emphasis on replicability uh, that has come, uh, that comes, you hear a lot more about it, right? And sort of the, the, the practices that you put in, that you use to sort of achieve those intermediate goals uh, are gonna be different. So uh, depending on what is the sort of the intermediate step you wanna reach. Um, and uh, the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that depending on who you are and what, what you wanna focus on and what, and, a given study, for example, you, you're not going to be able to have all of those, right? So uh, you're going to have to make choices. Uh, and as a field, it's important to uh, not put all our eggs in the same basket uh, so that we sort of do not necessarily just prioritize this, but keep all of those other things in mind. And uh, and that if anyone tells you this is the, the way to go, uh, it might not be uh, entirely true, just to say the least. And that you also want to keep in, in mind all those either all, all those other like um, things that actually are important aspects to good and high quality science. Okay, so that was sort of a very broad overview of what can, one can understand. I mean, at least my point of view of what uh, open science is, at least at the moment. I'm sure I will change my mind at one point. Um, so why do it though? Um, well, I think one reason why you might want to do it is because it's good for you. Um, so there is this idea that you share data and code. So it must be like, ultimately, it must be some sort of like the, the ultimate motive must be a selfish one, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and uh, similarly, working reproducibly uh, is not, uh, is, is also just definitely good for you. There's actually, a, um, oops. A paper about about this like that just go through a list of like five selfish reasons on why you want to work reproducibly um so yeah the, the the end motivation for me is also because it helps me work uh, in a more efficient manner on a day-to-day -day basis um okay why do, am i saying that well one of the reason is that um you get we often get into this situation when you start um when you start a phd you or a new project um, because 
sometimes you know you always start with a blank slate even if you have a postdoc or a pi you just start again and at the beginning you know things look pretty okay you're sort of on top of everything and you know where you're going but as the data and code accumulates um then it's kind of hard to find like to locate where you've put things and how everything is organized and by the end of your phd when you have to sort of write up and or when you have to leave the lab then it's a mess and you don't know where things are and then it's just yeah and the more you get there and the less you want to work on everything because it's just such a mess that you just want to run away uh and i'm i'm definitely you know teaching from experience uh, speaking from experience uh so learn from my mistakes uh this is you know we want to replicate things in in science but it doesn't mean that every experience uh, in life should be replicated so please um don't don't do don't do what i did uh why do we get there though you know um why do we rush why uh, you know haste makes waste so um one of the reasons is like we want to spend time answering our scientific question uh what we don't want to spend time in general is uh thinking about and implementing data structure thinking about how your data should be organized right um uh, that's that's definitely not something we just give a lot of uh, thought about. Similarly, uh, you know, if you're in a lab and you know things run smoothly and you say, well, the data is a mess and or the way it's organized um, uh, is a mess, uh, let's just change how we structure and organize that data. But then everyone's going to say, well, you know, but our code works well with the way things are, so now we're going to have re rewrite everything. Uh, and then usually when we get to the end, uh, something we have to do, but we don't want to spend time doing is that uh, we have to dig through our data and code to figure out how, what we're going to put in the method section. So, uh, and that's why usually we just forget a lot of details that are actually very important for anyone who would like to actually just to rerun the same study. So in general, it's like poor, you know, code and data curation leads to like, you know, just worse method section as well. Um, and so we don't want to spend time doing those things, uh, and so we tend to rush in general, right? I mean, and it is in a certain way perfectly understandable. You know, you have as a PI, you have a grant proposal, or like even as a as a PhD or as a postdoc, you have a grant proposal to finish, or you have a PhD dissertation to write. Or you don't have time for like you know organizing and cleaning my code and data, so you just rush. Uh, and one other thing we tell ourselves uh, is that, yeah, I will just clean this data or this code right before we submit, right? Right before we submit the paper or the PhD is like, you know, it's just like, yeah. And to me, every time I hear that and I, or every time that I think back of the time I've, I've told myself this, um, this sounds exactly like if I just said, I will just clean my teeth right before my dentist appointment. Like you just like never do it. The day before you go to the dentist, you clean your teeth once and then you're good. And we all know that's not how it works. Um, that this is not possible and that, you know, dental hygiene is an everyday thing. And similarly, code and um, data hygiene is something you should just do every day. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, why, uh, why do it though, like still? Um, well, I would say that if you do it regularly, it's going to make it very easy to then share the data and the code with your closest collaborator. And who could that be? Well, the odds are it is that it is you in six months uh, because you're going to have to just revisit your code or your data when you're reviewing a paper. Uh, sorry, when you've got the review on your paper or, you know, someone or you know, your ex-supervisor or your supervisor wants to have a look at something and you have to go and have to dig through those hard drives to figure out where everything is. And yeah, and most of the time, you know, we pay the price of our past that our past self have not decided to pay, right? So this the idea that later on you still have to maintain like crappy code or you have to go back to your old data and, you know, you can still just, you know, in that comic, you can just, travel through time, through a time machine, and just tell your past self that, um, you know, you should write better code because now I can, now in the present, I cannot understand it, right? Um, unfortunately, we don't have a time machine, so um, it tends to be better to just do everyday good you know, cleaning uh, a little bit so that the future becomes more manageable. Okay, so uh, for the rest of this, I just want to sort of uh, go a bit quickly through 
not all those points because that would take me ages. Uh, I want to sort of like emphasize certain aspects of some of those. And this is mostly, um, this talks mostly about data uh, and, and code. And I'm gonna just pick some of those and um, sort of run you through it. Um, so, and I'm gonna mix them together because otherwise, it's, uh, as I said, it will take me too long. So yeah, for every result, try to sort of keep track of how it was produced. Um, and usually one good way to do that is to do version control. If there is one thing I would have told my past self that I should have learned earlier uh, is definitely how to do version control, meaning how to check um, how the code evolves uh, through my project or even how the data, because you can also version control data. Uh, and I think we might have all gone through this, right? You start analysis, we've got a new project, you've got a bit of code and you've got some data. Uh, and then you sort of like create a new script that's a different version for the first one. So you've got like analysis put, uh, version two, and you've got like a new data set that you're trying to mix together, but you don't want to select, you also want to make sure that you can still go back to that old data set. So you create a new folder where you made a copy of this like first file. Um, so, so far it's still so good. Oh, but then you remember that um, everyone tells you you should back up things on like external like devices and not keep everything in the same place. And then you end up having a, like your project that is like still the same, but now you have a copy is, you know, that's like on OSF and then you've got something on an external hard drive. And then you, you don't really know which file is which, which version of which file lives where. And then you just, you know, want to lose hope and you start crying because you have no idea what's going on anymore. Um, and that sort of leads to that kind of situation, right, where you just like several versions of the same file and you have no idea. If you if you come as an outsider, if you come to this, you have no idea what to do, uh, what which one is the right one. It says use this one. OK, sure. But um, you might not, you might still not be sure unless there's very, very good documentation that comes with the project. Um, and you might think, okay, this is funny, but this is just a, a comic, right? Okay, this is um, a screenshot of the, my first uh, project where I did fMRI. And this is exactly what I was doing. I was doing a copy of the code every time I wanted to change something because I was afraid of, I could not, like I would break something and I wanted to go back to this old analysis. Um, and version control is something that prevents you from having to go through all these problems. Um, and you have two aspects, as I said, to version control. You can version just the code or the data and the code. Uh, some of you, um, if you uh, might have heard about Git, um, maybe fewer of you have heard of Datalad, which is uh, a tool that you can also use to uh, version control your data. Um, and so even if you are not like, you don't have a lot of code uh, in your project, I would still recommend you have a look at uh, Data Lad because uh, most of us have data. Um, so even if you have simulations, I suspect you have to sort of keep track of those and some version of control would be a good thing. Okay, uh, next thing, avoid manual uh, data manipulation. Um, that, you know, you know, we still all love Excel to a certain extent and we go back to it sometimes, uh, but this is usually not a good idea to work with data. Why am I saying that? Because I know this is one of the old Excel spreadsheets from something I did more than 10 years ago. I reopened it recently because I have to clean this data. And oh, it is painful, I can tell you. I have no idea what happened there. I'm um, not sure why some things here are red, why some things are, are orange. I'm still trying to reverse engineer this. Um, yeah, I could, spend four, I could spend hours just complaining about my past self there. But uh, in general, just avoid data, manual manipulation of things. And yeah, so there's clearly some things you just don't want to do. If you can try to write a script to do things, please do it. Your future self will definitely thank you. Um, another thing is that always store the raw data behind plots. So every time you make a figure, uh, try to uh, make <clears throat> a small file that sort of t says, okay, this is, the, this is the data that corresponds to this plot that I did here. Um, and one very obvious way to do this, that, that you should maybe do this, is when you publish a figure in a paper, try to provide alongside uh, or try to create to keep track of what are the data that went in there. So this is actually a, a figure from one of the like papers that I did like ten years ago. Um, 
And uh, this is what sort of the, the table that my uh, ex supervisor had done that contains some of the data from this. So at least you know, there was some sort of like track between sort of like, you know, you could know what data went into um, the making of this figure. The problem is that it's on a piece of paper that lives now on a JPEG on a hard drive, and there's no way that you know this can be reused for anything else. So, okay, this is not bad, not ideal, but definitely there's a way this can be optimized. But at least, hey, you've got some like you know traceability, or like uh, you can sort of know where this came from. Um, and and therefore, yeah, definitely try to save that in a format that can be easily reused, not on a piece of paper. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, that's something that um, I'll talk about more about that later. But um, you, whether you actually realize it or not, you're actually already re, uh, you are you are sorry, you are already sharing your data when you publish your results. Um, it's the most obvious when you have a scatter plot. So um, um, there should be a, there, there'll be a link to this tweet. But the idea is that there are some if you have a scatter plot of your data. On uh, in your paper, you can you know click quickly just go and use some tools to just figure out what the value is for each of that dot those dots on the um, on the scatter plot. So if the reviewer or if a reader can do that, why not just provide them directly with a table that you know represents the scatter plot because that will make everyone's life easier if they need to compare your results and theirs. Um, so another aspect is that every time you make a new analysis, uh, try to record like the intermediate results that led there. Um, and ideally try to organize those uh, in a hierarchical manner. Um, I'm gonna give you some examples that come from uh, neuroimaging now. So um, yeah, as I was saying, your results are a summary of your data. So most uh, neuroimaging paper, like for fMRI, for example, uh, include the peak coordinates, meaning that when you have an activation in the brain, it will show you where the activation was the highest in some parts of the brain. It will say, okay, this was this location uh, in the brain, um, and this was the activity we measured there with some statistics that goes with it. And most um, neuroscientific papers have this in them. Um, but it is a very, very summarized uh, version of the data, right? Uh, so you just have like, you know, just you, have, you just have uh, a few data points from something that's like covers the whole brain. Um, so a better way to do uh, to share that data or share those results is that you can uh, share what we call the whole statistical map, uh, meaning that you share an image, literally a, a 3D image represents the brain and gives you the activation at every point in the brain. Uh, so this way you've shared more of your results. The paper still contains the very summarized version, but for people who might be interested, uh, there's a way to access uh, sort of the results you had at every point uh, in the brain for this analysis or this study, for example. So the idea is like you create a less summarized version of your data. But the idea is also that uh, you know the the statistical map are then what gives uh, your sort of uh, peak coordinates. So you have this hierarchical way to organize your data. You summarize more and more your data, uh, and then obviously be below that you have you can share directly like the raw data, um, meaning uh, sort of you know sort of what got out of the scanner uh, in this case. Um, and then some people decide to even just share the raw data and the pre-processed data. But um, so the idea is that um, there are different levels at which you can share your data, and um, they all they all vary depending on the scale of cost uh, of data sharing and also hosting. Because obviously this is just uh, a few data points. This is not heavy at all. It's kind of fit into a table. And here we're talking about things that are going to take easily like gigabytes or uh, maybe possibly terabytes of data. Okay, and potential for reuse as well is definitely done not the same. If you have all the data, you have you can do a lot more than if you have to just have a single data point. And another thing that's super important as well is that um, as you go away from this like very rich data set, your data becomes also more anonymized and therefore easier to share. 
Okay, um, one thing to also keep in mind um, is to ideally just use standardized formats uh, to uh, organize your data or to share it, and ideally to add contextual information, usually that we call metadata. Um, and so use file formats that are interoperable, meaning that you can reuse them with sort of almost any other software and you don't have, you're not stuck on using just like Mac or uh, Windows in a specific software there. Uh, unless you wanna end up in conversion hell like I did two weeks ago because the software I had used to create some thing did not exist anymore. And it would just have to convert things through like five different software to, to end up having something I could reuse. Um, and these are like, I'm not gonna just go through the list of this, but just to tell you that usually depending on whether you're using metadata or data, there are some, some general recommendation of what format you should be using. Um, but what's very important to keep in mind is that maybe in your domain uh, of research, there are certain specific way to organize data that are even better than the one I, uh, that I showed you on the previous slides. Uh, and for example, in neuroimaging, we have uh, BIDS, which is the brain imaging data structure that you can use to organize your, your raw data, the stuff that comes out of the scanner. Or uh, if you want to share your statistical map, there's the, uh, this other thing that we call NIDN that, com that compiles all the information about a statistical map and the metadata about how you sort of created that result. Um, and about bids, I'm just going to say a couple of words because I could talk about that for hours and I could bore you to death. But the idea is just uh, a way to just, it, yeah, it, it's, it's, not, it's just a way to organize your data of how subjects should be organized, which type of, if you have anatomical data, then for example, it goes into a specific folder. If you've done some PET imaging that goes into a different folder, um, and you have very strict conventions of how the names of the files are supposed to be um, structured um, and where uh, the metadata for each file goes here, here into it, like this is an, a brain image and here you have all the metadata about that brain image stored into like a JSON file. The idea about this structure is that it is so, uh, so organized and you have clear specification of how to organize it that if you tell someone this is a bits data set, that's the only information they need to know and they will know where to find each piece of information. Uh, and in, and it, it's, a, it's a standard that's, a, that's expanding, started with MRI and covers also EEG, uh, uh, intracranial EEG and MEG, recently PET. Uh, and you can also store some, to a certain extent, some aspects of behavioral and physiological data. And it's expanding, so uh, things should, we should have like eye tracking and motion tracking and, and things like this. Um, okay, but it could be that you, you're in a field where you don't have such standards, right? So how do you do it? Well, then I would say that some standardization is better than no standardization at all. So trying to sort of have some way to organize your data in a systematic manner is better than just, you know, changing it from project to project. So try to see with the people in your lab whether you can have come to an agreement on how you want to structure things, for example, if you don't already have that. If you already have a, some, some way to organize things within your lab, good. Uh, keep building on that. This is great. And there's another project that's uh, a bit sort of uh, related to bids in a way, which is PsychDS for psychology data, uh, data structure uh, that tries that has a very sort of ambitious goal of trying to come up with a, a, um, a way to um, a data structure that would cover most of the type of data we have in psychology. Uh, and it's an open source project, so you can just always go there, see how, uh, how far how long they are, or like help them to just see how, how it covers your, your use case and so on. Um, all right, the last part is about, uh, the last part of, uh, but here is about providing public access to scripts, runs, and results. So the idea is about really about sharing uh, the code and the data. And something you're going to hear a lot about, uh, we don't necessarily talk about open data anymore. We talk more about fair data. Um, and this is a very sort of like, as well, a very broad concept, uh, but it just falls under four categories. The idea and one, one initial for each is like, you know, your data should be findable. It should be accessible, it should be interoperable, and it should be reusable. And you have here some very clear criteria about what, uh, what, um, what those you know, principles uh, refer to in practice. Um, one, I think, yeah, I don't want to like go for ages on this because this is, um, once again, 
too complex uh, to just cover in the time I have. So uh, one thing that I, I, wanna, I want you to keep in mind, and that's also related to FAIR, that FAIR data should be as open as possible and as close as necessary because uh, you know, open because in order to foster reusability and to access research, that's, that's what we want. But there is also this thing, especially in psychology, for example, when you're dealing with participants who have to give their consent and uh, it can also come with sensitive data. The idea is that you want at the same time uh, your data to be closed so that you can safeguard the privacy of your subject. So you always have those two things, like you want to make things open, but I don't want, you don't want to compromise your, uh, the, the privacy of your participants. Um, and when you're sharing data or code, actually, one thing to keep in mind is uh, long-term. Uh, so there are different you know, options that are around and they might not all sort of be there in five years. 10 years or 50 years, right? But there are some where uh, some of those options that I, there were, I've actually got some money from governments um, or from the Europe, European uh, Union in general, uh, where you can actually just like store things for long term. So the Open Science Framework is one of them. Um, Zenodo is another one. GIN uh, is based in Germany, is more specialized into neuroscience, but you could, you could totally just put like any kind of data there or code actually. Fixshare is another one of them. Um, GitHub uh, is for code, not for data. Uh, and I put, in, I put an arrow and that goes to Zenodo here because GitHub is owned by Microsoft now. Um, and it could be that maybe in five years or in 10 years, Microsoft decides to just like make this whole thing to close it down or just make the thing, this thing not completely open anymore. So um, it's better in that case if you putting some code on GitHub uh, to sort of then have uh, set up an archival process that can be automated that will then transfer all your code onto Zenodo, which is public and has funding for at least the next 50 years easily. One thing to keep in mind, avoid things like Dropbox and Google Drive um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, but one of them is, I would say that uh, if, if only because of this thing called GDPR, which uh, that regulates uh, so data protection, uh, that's based in like uh, European based rules. Uh, and the idea is that if you have data that relates to participants that are uh, from Europe, then that data is not supposed to leave Europe, right? So. Um, make sure that wherever you put your data, your data is not gonna end up on a server that's based in the US, for example, like it can be the case for Google or Dropbox. And in general, when you're not sure about those questions, uh, check what are the options that your institution offers and also check with, um, there should be one or several person in your institution called a data protection officer, and they will be able to advise you or where you should put your data. Uh, okay, and there was another point I want to talk about, but it was not mentioned in the article. So I had to create an 11th rule here. Um, and this one is much more about the code itself. Uh, and you want to make sure that your code is nice and readable. Um, and for example, not like this code. So this is actually a programming language called Whitespace. Uh, and the only thing this uh, language understands are spaces and tabs, nothing else. Uh, so this is just basically a very simple script that will just print hello world to the screen. Uh, and if you put any character in there, it will be completely ignored. So you could try to do your analysis in this, but it is not a, a very human friendly way to write your analysis. So remember that you're, you're, if, even if the code runs and the machine can understand what you wrote in terms of code, remember that another human being, possibly you in the future, will have to read that code again. Similarly, uh, you know, you can make very pretty pictures uh, with your code. It doesn't necessarily uh, help readability in general. Um, uh, so, yes, please make sure your code is nice and readable and you don't have to do some sort of like code archaeology when uh, you go back to your old code. And once again, uh, you will be um, thanking yourself in the future for having tidy, for keeping things tidy um, as you go. Um, and there are ways to make your life easier with this. Uh, there are ways mm -hmm. to... 
Yep. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but uh, there is there are only one or two minutes left if we want to have uh, yeah. time um, enough for the questions. Yep. Okay. No problem. I was I was actually checking the time as well. So um, there's a link there to a demonstration of how some things can be automated using some tools for Python, but it also exists uh, on uh, for other type of languages. And you can check the awesome website of the Turing way to do this. Uh, one book I would like to recommend uh, is The Art of Readable Code. Uh, not only not just for the pictures, but also because it is um, uh, a pro like it's like it's, it's for beginners. If you've never or almost never coded, it's definitely something I would highly recommend. Um, I am going to skip that one, uh, except just to say that one good tip I could give you is that before you publish an article, um, give the data and the code to a colleague of yours and have them recreate the figures, see if they can do it. Uh, that is usually a very good stress test of your, uh, your workflow and see if you, uh, how reproducible or how easy and intuitive things are uh, in terms of organization. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. And a couple of uh, last things. Don't try to do everything when it comes to open science. Don't try to do all the things all together. Uh, it's more like see it as a buffet. Don't try to stuff yourself on everything and only select what works for you for a given study uh, and go easy step by step. Um, it's very tempting also to go like, oh, I don't want to share my code. It's too ugly. And, you know, I will never, you know, it's like people are going to, I'm going to be judged uh, on my code. Um, yes, I can understand, but I think you'd be pretty self-conscious about your smile if no one had told you what a toothbrush is and how, uh, how to use it. Uh, and coding is not taught yet. So go easy on yourself. Don't blame yourself for um, something that the current system does not provide you with. Um, okay, I'm going to skip that because the analogy here will take too long to explain. Sorry about that. I definitely overshot there. Except uh, I'm just going to dwell on this slide just for a little bit that some of those skills uh, are transferable skills uh, that you could use for, to do a whole bunch of things outside of science. And that um, the vast majority of people just do not stay in science. That's just a, a, a flow of where people are going uh, in science from the Royal Society in the UK. Um, and I always find it weird that if you quit science, you're called a failure when the vast majority of people are just living happy life outside of science. So that always something that I find uh, just a bit, a bit weird. So. Yeah, just uh, go easy on yourself. Uh, if you find it hard to learn all those new things, that sets the bar even higher for you than it did for um, our predecessors. Um, yeah, so be kind to yourself and to others. Um, if you struggle, ask for help. Uh, if you see someone struggling, help them. And uh, the idea around um, open science is definitely linked, tightly linked to the idea of community, but the idea also of trying to find the right one for you. So they can be found online, and I know, I'm sure you know some of them. I know that you know uh, the Society for the Improvement of uh, SIPS, so the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science has their own Slack channel. Uh, um, the Turing Way uh, that I mentioned a couple of times is also a, a very lively community. Myself, I found that um, this other community called the Brain Hack is one that I, I, I identify with. So that's where I find happy. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with. And yeah, and I'm, yeah, so these are different, some of the different ways uh, where you can find help or just other people, like minded people in sort of the open science world. Um, and I think on that note, I will just say thank you for your attention and sorry to have sort of rushed through the end and not tied myself properly on this. Well, thank you, Remy. Um, it, it, it's very difficult to be the one that have to stop your presentation because <laughs> it, it was very interesting and, and cheerful and the kind of thing that we want to listen to when we are uh, PhD students. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to stop the recording.